Good day to you all, and a very warm welcome as we continue our studies in the book of James. This Sunday, the 1st of November, we look at James, but the following Sunday, the 8th of November, is Remembrance Sunday. So we will be leaving James and turning into Daniel chapter 7 to look at a portion of that particular text for Remembrance Sunday. But for the moment, James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. If you have your Bibles there, would you please open them? James chapter 5, and we read God's inerrant word together, 5 from 1 through to 6. James writes, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like a fire. You've laid up your treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the labourers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Amen. And we thank God for his inerrant word to us this morning. Let's just come before God in prayer. Let's reflect and ask for his blessing and guidance. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, as we continue to look at this book that you inspired to be written, a challenging book, yet a rewarding book, challenging in that it makes us think that we have to look inward at ourselves and realise that all is not right. And yet it is an encouraging book because it encourages not after the fact that we have to look in, but the fact that we should do something about what we see. And in doing so, to move ever closer to you through your son, Jesus Christ. We're aware, O oh Lord, that we fall well short of the mark. We're aware, O oh Lord, that we are not the people we ought to be. And we are aware, O oh Lord, that we have sinned against you and our brethren. And so much of that is firmly revealed to us in this little book of James. How we've stumbled, how we've erred. And in this particular passage, we may not be the wealthy who have committed fraud against any number of employees or day labourers. But nonetheless, O oh Lord, we are in many ways better off than a great number of people in this world. Help us, O oh Lord, by confessing that we owe so much to you, and especially to what you did for us in Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. So forgive our sins. Let us be outward looking, forward looking, looking to help others looking to bring the comfort of Christ to those who mourn, to those who are ill, to those who are in need. And allow us, O oh Lord, to be merciful to those who need mercy. And allow us, O oh Lord, that by your grace, we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, in this uncertain age, we know not where we're going or what is happening. So help us to commit our trust to you, O Lord, because you know. 
how things will end. And we pray, Father, for those who are suffering, that you would bring comfort, peace, and healing, and hope. But we also give you thanks, O Lord, and pray a blessing upon those who work long and difficult hours for so little at times, those in care homes, those who do menial tasks across society, and in hospitals too. We think of nurses and doctors, paramedics, who are often witnessing dreadful scenes of sorrow and pain. And so we've much to be thankful for that in a civilised society, we do have people that care and provide comfort and ease of pain. So be with them as they do their jobs in these difficult and somewhat dangerous days due to this pandemic. We pray, Father, for our church while we're getting directions about what we can and can't do, Lord, we pray for our church nationally to call on the nation to repent, how we really need to repent and seek your face as individuals, as churches, and as corporately as a nation. Oh, Lord, we're astray, and judgment will loom if it isn't already engaged with us at this moment in time. Lord of mercy and stay your hand, we pray. Bring revival and reveal yourself as a God of love, mercy and grace in your son, Jesus Christ. Reveal, O Lord, to the lost that you are indeed the God who cares. Grant, O Lord, hope and grant that in giving hope that people would see that it is to you they must turn to for that hope to be realised in their lives for time and eternity through Christ our Lord. So as we turn into this word from James, may your inerrant word speak to our hearts with the message that you would have for each one of us, an individual and unique message that we would receive from this word, that we would draw closer to you and give better service to Christ in the making of disciples. For we ask these our prayers in the wonderful name of your beloved Son, our only Saviour and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're turning into James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6 this morning. John Steinbeck wrote a novel called The Peril, it's a story of a poor peril diver who dreamed of finding a large peril, a perfect peril of great worth. One day, he does discover a large oyster, and that oyster delivers a large, perfect peril. This peril he dubs the peril of the world. News of this immense peril and this very fortunate find swiftly travels throughout his village and beyond. His neighbours begin to feel bitter towards him for his good fortune. The story uh, doesn't unfold with great prospect for this young man. His tranquil life is turned into a nightmare and death appears. Finally, his dream of wealth evaporates when he eventually throws the peril into the sea. Thus, all hopes of wealth and a good life are evaporating. This young man had placed his hope in a peril to lift him out of his poverty. But his dreams of wealth faded into obscurity. Many, many wrongly believe the Bible teaches that it's wrong to be wealthy. They think the Bible says money is the root of all evil. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. This is what the Bible does say. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, 
into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through the craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many pangs. In these six verses which make up our text or our passage for today, James does not make an appeal for repentance. Rather, he delivers a scathing pronouncement of God's wrath that's going to come down on those who love money. And his main target are the ungodly rich who sit in the church week by week. It is they whom he confronts. So firstly, wealth can lead the ungodly to eternal destruction. Secondly, greed can be used to oppress others. And thirdly, people live, God's people live and die differently. Firstly, <clears throat> wealth can can lead the ungodly to eternal destruction. Please look at verses 1 through to 3. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. And their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasure in the last days. The rich often like to display their wealth. That's very evident if you read some of the tabloids. And I understand that I, I, I don't watch it, but I, I understand there are television channels that devote themselves to those kind of people who have sort of vague lives of indulging in this, that and the other simply because they have to. They're actually airheads because they've no inclination towards knowing truth, knowing God in Christ. They think their wealth is their salvation. James says to the rich who display their wealth, beware. Your wealth makes you a ready target for the thief, the envious, the oppressed. And here he speaks with prophetic zeal against the rich in the church who hoard wealth and oppress the poor. He is not writing to the world. He's not writing to the sage of Oma. He's not writing to some multi-billionaires like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, he is writing to people who sit under the word week by week, who use their wealth, hoard wealth, and oppress the poor. The psalmist writes, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. And our saving Lord said, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? Jews believed that charity to the poor would be a credit to the wealthy man in the world to come. A man's true wealth would consist not in what he kept, but in what he gave away. Now, possessions are not in themselves a sin, 
but they are nevertheless a great responsibility. Abuse of wealth is another form of envy, coveting and strife. Now remember in chapter 1, James presents the gospel by showing the recipients of this epistle that true religion controls the tongue, looks after the widows and orphans, and is unpolluted by the world. And then in the second chapter, he addresses the indifference to the needy. And then in the third chapter, he takes up fields of speech. And in four and five, he reaches a climax with a twofold call to humility in chapter four, with God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, and then the call to humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And then this is followed as he examines the sin of pride and the failure to show humility before God. And then he speaks about maligning and judging your brethren, making presumptive plans for the future. And here in our passage, we see the financial power that is used to oppress the poor and indulge the rich. Money is like a fire. It can be used for good. But once it controls men, it can ruin their lives. And James speaks with a certain prophetic anticipation. Verse 1, miseries that are coming upon you. He anticipates bitter wailing on the part of the wealthy who shall meet with the ultimate of grief beyond measure. Thus he commands, weep and howl. It's a picture of perpetual grief over the miseries they face. So what are the miseries of which James speaks? In prophetic mode, there may have been both an imminent and ultimate misery. And this epistle was written before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 under Titus. And it is said that a million people died in the siege of Jerusalem, a siege that lasted two years. And once the walls were breached, the first targets the soldiers made for were the houses of the rich. James could have been pointing to an earthly misery that would soon happen. But probably he had more in mind. He was not so concerned with the temporal happenings as with the eternal. And certainty of divine judgment was looming over the rich. They took to themselves the finest of things while denying the needy the help they cried out for. But when the rich face their creator as their judge, then their wealth will not buy their way out of divine punishment. John Blanchard, in his book Truth for Life, tells the story of a godless American farmer who wrote to his local newspaper explaining, I've been conducting an experiment in one of my fields. I have ploughed it on Sundays, sowed the seed on Sundays, watered and weeded it on Sundays, and gathered the harvest on Sundays. And I want to tell you that this October, I have the finest crop of Indian corn in the whole neighbourhood. The local editor replied by adding a footnote. God does not settle all his accounts in October. The future, as well as the present, belongs to the Lord. He promises the miseries of judgment. When Paul addressed the rich, he called for change. In his letter to Timothy, he writes, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that 
which is truly life. Unlike Paul, James isn't calling for change here. He's calling for judgment. Look at verses 2 to 3. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasure in the last days. He is condemning the hoarders of grain, clothing, and gold and silver. In James' mind, it's a certainty that these riches will go bad. And so he speaks of it as already having occurred. Riches are uncertain and they will vanish. He's saying those who will trust in grain will find their grain will rot and suffer from mildew. For those in the clothing industry, their garments will be moth-eaten. The value of gold and silver will fall dramatically. Hoarded gold and silver shall corrode, tarnish and fade away. This passion to hoard will burn them so deeply inside it will begin to consume them long before they're cast into the lake of fire. They will be eaten alive by their own desire to acquire more and more and more and more wealth, a passionate desire that will be uncontrollable, which will eventually send the ungodly rich to hell. It is not money, but this passion for money that eats man's flesh like fire. Judas was the go to money man for the disciples, but he had this lust for money and he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Like the poor peril diver who threw his perfect peril away, Judas turned on himself and ended his life by hanging himself. You'll recall in Luke chapter 16, the rich man who was in Hades, not dressed in purple, and there in torment, he's begging for Lazarus who was on the other side of the gulf that separated them to bring a drop of water to cool his tongue. Some of the richest people on this planet have identified themselves as atheists, but their denial of God will not exempt them from judgment. Their stored up treasures will be used as a witness against them when they stand at the bar of the great assizes facing judgment. It is James' conviction that to concentrate on material things is not only to concentrate on a decaying delusion, it is to concentrate on self-produced destruction. And secondly, greed can be used to oppress others. Please look at four. Behold, the wages of the labourers who mowed the fields which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. James has in mind here wealthy landowners. Obviously, some wealthy landowners were in the church. And these wealthy landowners would hire day labourers to work in their field. Day labourers, like the ones in Jesus' parable of the vineyard, were at the end of the day paid for the labour. And in this kind of setup, it's crucial the worker gets his wages immediately, because most likely he's living day to day dependent on these payments. For each night he goes home and uses what he has earned to feed himself and his family that night. And that's why it says in Leviticus 19 and 13, the wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. And then in Deuteronomy 24 verses 
14 and 15. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brethren or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets. And then Moses goes on, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you will be guilty of sin. This is a sin that often accompanies wealth. The greed for more and more wealth can produce a total disregard for others and a disregard for what is right and proper. In this case, wealthy landowners are keeping back wages that workers have earned. And this still goes on today. And I'm convinced we'll see more of it as the year ends with more companies closing down. The first thing in most, if not all cases, is there's not enough to pay redundancies. And second, there's a serious deficit in the pension fund. All too often, unscrupulous owners have plundered a company to the verge of bankruptcy, then fold it, leaving the government to pay out the statutory minimum and redundancy payments. And this also leaves the pension fund short and thus the Pension Protection Fund has to step in to make up the deficit, in some cases substantial. And in some companies that are household names, and although they are trading and certainly not bust far from it, their pension deficits are in the hundreds of millions, as any search engine will reveal. Remember this letter in this passage is not addressing the unregenerate out with the church. He is addressing those who claim to be regenerate, who worship week by week in the local church. And this is a seething indictment that has no call for repentance. James is highly critical of these men, ungodly men. He's scathing of the unregenerate rich who are taking advantage of the poor. Now you may say to yourself, this epistle, in particular this passage, does not apply to us. Think again. We must not forget what Paul wrote to Timothy. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what, would, what should we do, we who are twice born, what should we do with this passage of scripture? Is God really talking to us? The answer to that question is, he is. Is God against those who have great wealth? No, he's not. Think of Job, who is righteous and very rich. So too is Abram, who who was not short of a bob or two. And remember, he was called a friend of God by James in chapter 2. James is warning those who set their affection on riches rather than God. The Bible only condemns the rich who store up and hoard wealth instead of using it to reach the lost, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to shelter the cold and homeless, nurse the sick, and use it to spread the gospel of free grace. This is a message that calls us to live uprightly with integrity. Don't cheat, don't steal, pay your bills, pay your taxes, don't rob God, don't take shortcuts, don't deceive others. Honest hard work is ordained by God, and we should all know that. Here are some interesting definitions. Communism. You have two cows. The government takes one and gives you part of the milk. Socialism. You have two cows. The government takes one cow and gives it to your neighbour. Fascism. You have two cows. The government takes both and sells you the milk. Nazism. You have two cows. The government takes both and shoots you. Bureaucracy. You have two cows. 
the government takes both, shoots one, milks one, and pours the milk down the drain. Capitalism, you've two cows, you sell one and buy a bull. Thirdly, God's people live and die differently. Look at verses five and six. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Remind you of anyone? Jesus himself is the example of a righteous man who did not resist the horrible mistreatment laid upon him by powerful men. He did nothing wrong at all, yet he was betrayed by a greedy man for money. Psalm 116 verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The moment our Heavenly Father withholds the breath from our lungs, we enter into glory to be with him. You leave behind whatever you brought into this world. You leave behind all your wealth. You leave behind all the pain and anguish. You leave behind everything that you had in this earth. And in front of you, eternity stretches. Eternity in the presence of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God who sent his son to die for you at Calvary to take away your sin. Now, we don't know when we shall die. We don't know how we shall die. We don't know where we shall die. But Romans 8 and 28 tells us, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Some say they are saved. But the way you can really tell whether somebody is saved is that they're different because they think differently, they act differently, they speak differently, and they'll certainly want to speak about matters spiritual. People are different. But God's people are different because God is sanctifying their lives. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, put it this way. The saints are walking pictures of God. James highlights this difference in the opening verses of chapter 5. He says, you and I are not to envy them because they're different. All they treasured in life will be taken away from them on death. Then what? Off to a lost eternity. If you're not saved and don't know Christ as your saviour, why not come to him now? For to know him in time is to be with him for all eternity. By inviting him into your life and repenting of your sin, you're opening yourself up to a new way of living, an eternal life in his presence. What we have in this life, we leave behind when we die. But we take our soul to either heaven or to hell. And if we know Christ as our Saviour and Lord, we go into his presence. And that's the promise that he's made in his inerrant word. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we do thank you for your word. Lord, a harsh lesson in these six verses. But we pray, Father, by your spirit. Your spirit would apply the lessons that we need to learn. A lesson that is peculiar and particular to our, each individual and each individual's needs. May your spirit move, Lord, that we would understand and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Work in our lives to bring you the glory.
for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a reminder that next week is Remembrance Sunday. We'll be turning into Daniel chapter 7. And I do hope you'll be able to join me as we remember with thanksgiving those who gave of themselves that we might live in freedom. Bye for now. Stay safe and blessings for the week ahead.